Dear participants, uh, welcome to SEI Currents 2024. Um, today, we'll be looking ahead at some of the fundamental streams of change in the world that we in SEI like to call currents. My name is Mons Nilsson. I'm the executive director of SEI, and this will be the third annual edition of Currents. We build these currents based on consultations around our research centers around the world. SEI has centers in Estonia, Thailand, Kenya, Colombia, US and UK, and of course, uh, the headquarters here in Stockholm. And over these uh, six regions, we have globally connected research institute with its ear to the ground in these different locations, but also our ability to cross mobilize leverage expertise across the centers to address and approach sustainable development questions that are truly universal, such as climate change, mitigation and adaptation, natural resources and ecosystems governance, and people's lives, health and well being connected to, for example, um, pollution and sanitation. To develop these currents or these descriptions of currents and analysis, we carry out survey of our experts. Uh, we have focus groups around the world, and then we refine and consult and interview our lead experts, uh, always with an eye to the global arena and how it connects to the regions that we work in. And the three currents are published right now at two o'clock Central European time on our website um, and you can look at them uh, in more detail later on. Actually, looking back at last year, we had uh, some currents that were including discussions on the democracy deficit, the rise of authoritarianism, conflicts and war, which we have indeed seen escalating across, for example, the Sahel and the Middle East. Uh, we had the technology disruption, with AI as a main driver, and indeed AI has really overturned things during 2023. And we had the cost of living crisis and the inflation. And you know, I I think while it was impossible to predict how these would play out and affect everyone, they were very much the most important ones that shaped international events during 2023. Just to give an example of the complexity, <clears throat> if we talk about cost increases, this would make you think that, for example, increased cost of capital interest rates would work against renewable electricity installations as compared to fossil fuels, since the capex costs are relatively a much larger share in renewables. But we're now noting that the increased cost of capital has not really slowed down the expansion of renewable electricity which is now set to almost triple by 2030, truly remarkable capacity expansions, both for production capacity and installed capacity. This was really not evident, uh, uh, you know, and how the inflationary pressures have affected the energy market. It's very complex, but I think we were on the right uh, sort of focus area, although predicting how it would play out is a much more difficult thing. Um, the three currents that will be presented here today plays a significant role for us, not just this webinar, but also as we are now in the process of, of developing our next five-year strategy and building on, of course, what we have done well at SEI and what we're interested in researching, but also adapting to the changing global context. Finally, the year 2024 is a bit of a nervous year for us both in terms of how conflicts will play out in the world, but perhaps even more for us, how key elections will turn out as we have elections coming up in the European Union, parliamentary election and new commission in the United States and in India. Uh, but let's uh, now get into the real business and, and hear about some of these fundamentals that without the doubt will shape these elections and other global events. So I'll hand over to Robert Watt, our Global Engagement Director at SEI, to take us through the 2024 currents. Over to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Mons. Um, 
And uh, a very warm welcome from me as well to all of our online participants today and our fantastic panel uh, that you'll be hearing from a little bit later. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky. I'm in a great position. I'm the one that gets to, uh, you know, look at the results of SEI gazing into its crystal ball and give you a, a summary of the three currents that we've uh, we've come up with. Um, but before I get into those three, um, I wanted to sort of get you into the right mindset of thinking about well, currents. Well, why do we call these trends that are influencing in some way sustainability in the coming 12 months or so? Why do we call them currents in the first place? Well, I mean, you might imagine that, well, perhaps we've been inspired by just simply the idea of current affairs. These are things that are on the uh, in the minds of policymakers and and business leaders uh, globally, and 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 there's something to that certainly, uh, but perhaps we should delve a little bit into the the etymology of current and current affairs. It, it really comes and from au courant, the French, to be well informed. So yeah, this is again something that we hope to be able to do through uh, these currents is to look at the uh, what's out there and, and make sure that we're well informed, but. We can delve even further there into current and, and where does current and courant come from? Well, it comes from the Latin. It comes from the Latin for running or flowing. And this makes you think perhaps of, well, history is simply just one thing after another as things flow. But on the other hand, you may also be reminded of what the philosopher Herodotus said about uh, flowing rivers that a person can never step into the same river twice, nor will that person be the same person to, um, uh, if, it, if, if they, they try to do so. Um, and the, this, is, this is absolutely, I think, something that we want to, to get across when we thought about the name of currents, that yes, they want to be about current affairs, things that are actual and, 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 and matter now, but they're also reflecting the fact that these currents are affecting the course of those events that they shape the, the, the way in which the river flows, but also that even those that are dipping their toes into the river are, are also affected by these currents. Another way of thinking about currents, of course, is like uh, in, in terms of electricity, um, the flow of, well, let's hope it as many green electrons as possible is, is part of, of, of the idea of currents. They're the things that power our homes and even this webinar. But currents and electricity can lead to some shocks as well. And not only that, they create magnetic fields that attract and deflect things. And that's another way that we want you to think about these currents, that they're pushing and pulling against each other, that they may affect, affect each other as well. I'm sure that many people on uh, listening in today will have been aware of the recent World Economic Forum Global Risks Report. Uh, perhaps it should be called almost the Global Pessimism Report this year at least, where I think some very large majority, I think even 90% of respondents felt that there was a good chance that there was going to be some sort of uh, catastrophe in the medium term. What we want to do with our currents is not only look at the dire realities of the world as it is now, but also look at the opportunities and the signposts for how we're going to deal with these challenges over the next 12 months. We want to be seeing where those winds are blowing, and we want to be able to read the currents so that we can avoid any riptides. Ultimately, this whole exercise, including our discussion with panelists and hearing from you as well during the course of this event, it's trend spotting and trend setting. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first current, um, which is on the subject of climate change. And it's all about the target, or one of the targets of the Paris Agreement, this 1.5 degree target. And has 1.5, has a number ever carried more of a warning? Um, last year was a record year when it came to temperature. And this year, with the effects of last year's El Nino hanging over us uh, into this year, there is a good chance that we'll be seeing uh, 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 us exceeding this 1.5 degree uh, target. 
in many places. So 1.5 degrees is perhaps here now. And that's despite this breakneck technological progress that we've seen, the advantageous economies of renewables, and of course the evidence of our own eyes, whether that is in flooding or in forest fires, and the multiple political declarations that we've had over the last decade or so. Ultimately, we seem to be in some sort of paradox, one where we can, after COP28 in Dubai, begin to sort of talk about the end of the fossil fuel era, that there may be a peak in fossil fuel use in sight, but at the same time, concerned that that peak may lead simply to another plateau. In the same way, emissions, again, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases may also be at a peak, or at least that peak be coming in sight. And yet the, there seem to be transition headwinds, headwinds that may be to do with politics and elections that Mons has already alluded to, or the difficulty in just simply implementing at warp speed all of these solutions. So for 2024, we're thinking that actually this discussion is going to be, well, it could be about doom and gloom. It could be one that then drives people to discuss extreme solutions and policies, things such as geoengineering. Or it could be talking more constructively and pragmatically about how to deal with this overshoot, how to make sure that we limit both the magnitude and duration of exceeding 1.5 degrees so that we begin to talk about how it's important that every month, week and day that we avoid straying beyond 1.5 degrees, that, that those things matter. And during the course of this year, those elections that we've already heard about, those that are taking place in the European Union, in India, in Indonesia, as well as the one in the United States, that those will be critical in determining perhaps the extent to which we can chart a pathway away from the doom and more towards pragmatism and trying to get to that warp speed implementation. We're also in a period where we're preparing for the next round of nationally determined contributions. That'll be 2025, but already people will be turning their minds to that. And in the European Union, there will be a proposal put forward in the next month and a half or so relating to a 2040 climate target. And lastly, when it comes to geoengineering, for example, there's going to be discussion of that at the United Nations Environment Assembly in about a month and a half's time. So the governance of these things is still hot. It's still really on the agenda. So there are plenty of signposts for the ways and the forums in which we'll be discussing these things. Let me go to our second current, if I can now. And so our second current is, is perplexingly perhaps called the new space race. Now, I don't want you to cast your minds back to landing people on the moon in this case, but rather we're talking about space in terms of the competition, the race for control over access to minerals, to land for food production, for land to site energy. And that goes also for oceans as well. So it is all about competition for access to land, oceans, but also in space. And I'll come to that in due course. Of course, you know, this idea of having a race and competing over strategic assets has been around forever, in a sense. Seizing and expropriating resources, uh, making sure you have control over trade routes, whether that's the Silk Road or the spice trade, that's been the subject of people such with names such as Alexander William and Genghis um, in the past. The, the, the fact is that now we need to do it all in terms of making sure that we are feeding people, that we are powering the energy transition and have the right resources to do so, that we are taking care of ecosystems, not only for their ecological and cultural value, but also as critical carbon dioxide sinks. It was about 55 years ago that the image that you see in front of you was taken by William Anders, the astronaut. 
And he said that we had then set out to explore the moon, but instead discovered the Earth. And perhaps this year is another time in which we need to do that again, to make sure that we understand how, who, get what, who gets what and why. The fact is that governments may be facing some pretty untenable choices, or at least unenviable ones at least, between feeding people, meeting time at targets, preserving nature. Thinking about prosperity today, weighed up against safeguarding the well-being of people tomorrow. And I promised I'd say something a little bit about the race in space as well. A place where low orbit satellites is opening up new ways for us to understand and rediscover the world and monitor its health. But where also some extraordinary ideas related to uh, mining on the moon are actively being discussed. And actually, there is a moment this year where that will be on the agenda, which is at the summit of the future, uh, uh, at the, towards uh, the uh, end of this year, in September this year, where the future of outer space governments will be on the, uh, will be discussed. When it comes to access to critical raw materials, lithium and copper, for example, which are often the subject of quite a lot of uh, debate, but also on the ground uh, competition, whether that is lithium in Zimbabwe or copper in Panama. The legislation that's taking place and, and is going through the machinery in, in, in the European Union will be one that we should keep an eye on in the EU's Critical Raw Materials Act. And then when it comes to oceans and how we use them, well, the High Seas Treaty is there, and we really have an opportunity now to move it forward to a stage of ratification, of actually making sure that we are sustainably protecting our ocean resources. Lastly, our third current. Our third current is the future of multilateralism. I really can't say much more here than just to read out the, the first quote on this slide. The world is on fire, literally and figuratively. And we are faced with the key question of who can put out these kinds of fires in this kind of world. At the moment, this world is one facing geoeconomic competition, geostrategic um, tensions, and geopolitical fragmentation. And yet at the same time, we know that the challenges of reaching net zero, of transitioning uh, our energy systems, and of reducing inequalities requires international cooperation. The question is, will this year be a year where we are reinventing multilateralism? Whether are we replacing it? Or are we seeing a proliferation of other forums? where constraint, multilateralism is so constrained that we see other forms of perhaps pragmatic pluralism taking over. The evidence is that our efforts through multilateral or uh, institutions and agreements have not succeeded yet. We see conflict. But we also know that the SDGs are off target and that inequalities are increasing, that we're not really on track for that Paris Agreement for climate change. Nonetheless, even the head of the United Nations Environment Programme has identified some silver linings in this multilateral um, uh, ecosystem. She points to the fact that there are multilateral environmental agreements that are making progress, that there's a new renewal of our efforts to deal with dangerous chemicals that the Convention on Biological Diversity is making real headway in protecting the environment. And of course, we have finally a plast global plastics pollution treaty that is being discussed. So it's not as though we're completely locked in to this fragmentation and conflict, but patchy implementation is making things far more difficult and is increasing the lack of trust between the parties who need to be working together to put out the fires. And after all, it is now 80 years, almost 80 years since the end of the Second World War, which led to the United Nations. And, but by all yardsticks, the world has been remade since then. 
just to give you one extraordinary statistic. At that time, 80 countries that are now independent were then colonies, let alone all of the progress in terms of economic development, in access to technologies, as well as just basic services. But it's clear that institutions have not kept up. Kept up. They're seen rather by some, certainly, as propping up the established order. There are all sorts of things out there that are trying to grasp this. The Bridgetown Initiative is looking at finance and financial institutions and how they can make sure that people can, you know, the poorer countries have uh, access to capital so that cost of capital isn't a, a, such, the, the sort of barrier to transitions and development that it currently is. We also see some interesting developments in terms of uh, plurilateral uh, 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 gatherings such as the BRICS constellation now expanding this year. And it'll be so interesting to see how this year that uh, constellation of countries begins to influence the direction of multilateralism and pragmatic pluralism. The elections that are taking place this year are a big backdrop to all of this as well. Tai Taiwan, we've already been through, but India is in April. Indonesia, the European Parliament, the United States, last of all, perhaps this year. How much will those elections affect this agenda? How much will they be expressions of green lash? And lastly, I'll leave you with the summit of the future the United Nations Secretary General's effort to try and bring together these uh, uh, world actors, world leaders, to discuss the future of multilateralism, but also how we work collectively, collaboratively, cooperatively to deal with the fires that rage in the world today. Thank you so much for listening to this summary of our three currents. You'll find all of them now on SEI's website with plenty more detail and examples. And I want to give a, a huge thanks to the team that has put together these currents uh, in the form that you can read them on our website. And that is uh, Karen, Lindsay and Ulrike. A huge thank you to you. And now... I can introduce our keynote speaker who will set the scene for our, our panel discussion. And we're extremely honored to be able to uh, introduce you to our newest board member at SEI, but also the former president of Estonia, Kesti Kaljulaide. Dear crowd of Stockholm Environment Institute, hey, say, I'm uh, very happy to turn to you as the fresh board member of SEI from Tallinn. I'm making this video moments after President Zelensky made his speech in Estonian Parliament over Igikogu and his plane is now taking off towards Riga. And that is maybe the first um, thing I wanted to mention which concerns 2024 is the difficulty of finding the right balance between geopolitics and protection of climate and nature. Of course, geopolitics is on our all minds. We all think about security and safety. Therefore, it is very easy to forget that there is a bigger fight, even bigger fight going on because it doesn't seem to be so urgent to many people. But of course, we all know it is. Europe had its warmest year last year and the perspective is looking pretty bad. People are even talking about the temperature rises of three degrees by the end of the century, which of course is not acceptable, even in the climates and countries which are least affected by the climate change. Estonia, by the way, while ranking among the countries which is least impacted by the climate change, is at the same time one of the countries where temperature is changing the fastest. And the unpredictability which this is causing is extremely hard for us to tolerate. It means storms, snowstorms, cuts of electricity far more often than we are used to. So we have to become more resilient even industrially to the climate change now. Of course, if people had listened what had been said since 1960s, then we would not have been here. But we are. In a way, of course, 
humankind is at the turning point. I noticed this year at the COP um, in uh, Dubai, weird place to have a COP, but nevertheless, I noticed that the countries which are consumers of imported energy were quite self-confident and the producers of fossil fuels, they were far more worried, which means that we are reaching the point where new technologies allowing us to use clean energy are now becoming more competitive than fossil fuels are. Yes, of course, we still have to resolve the issue of storage. And what I really wish for Europe for 2024 is that amid the elections, amid the new commission taking uh, post in, in Brussels, somehow, somewhere, we would have a time to settle the European storage market. Because without that, it is very difficult to predict that wind and solar energy on which we plan to rely will be really energy sources which our citizens will trust. Here in Estonia, it is right now the biggest debate go nuclear or trust into wind and storage. We urgently need a storage market for our energy revamp here. What is of course good news for climate uh, uh, issues is that the geopolitical and climate problems work in the same direction, at least in Europe. Because if Europe wants to become energy independent, then of course that means sustainable energy simply because energy does not have fossil alternatives in Europe. We are not rich in fossil fuels. And where we have them, for example, in Netherlands, thinking of fracking, we do not want to use them. There is a little catch, of course, in all of this. And this relates to the issue of biodiversity and ecosystem protection versus climate protection. How? At the same time, we are trying to become more self-sustainable in energy sector. We are also looking for ways and means to be more self-sustainable on rare earths and other minerals, which Europe traditionally has imported. But maybe it is not such a bad thing if Europe, with its careful eye on biodiversity and ecosystem protection, will also develop and find the ways on how to mine without ruin. This is something which I hope also in 2024 we will see clearly at the forefront of our climate and biodiversity discussion. This for me is a risk which I hope will turn into an opportunity. Europe also continues its independent development of industrial policy. Europe has been traditionally very much free market oriented and I sincerely hope that it remains this way. Even if I would say that right now in Europe, all various issues, starting from climate, relating also to independence, etc., are actually looking towards more protectionism than more truly market-based solutions. And here I really hope that the beer drinking nations of the European Union, those around the Baltic Sea, will stick together to stand for free market-based solutions. Why? because we are the small open economies and big subsidies, be it in energy or other industrial sectors in Central Europe, these will be a serious real problem for us. So I hope that in 2024, we do all stick together again in European elections, again in our statements towards the new European Commission, that we stand for free market development of new technologies. Yes, we need to create our green bubble. We need to make sure that Europe as a whole has an industrial policy, but it should always be Brussels-based, Europe as a whole. Similarly to agricultural subsidies, they are only allowed from European budget. If we want in industrial policy and energy policy, the subsidies to be neutral among European member states, they all have to be only Brussels-based, starting from European budget. And national subsidies should not be so, uh, so big uh, as to ruin the common market altogether. This is a risk, but if we are very clear in what we want, Nordic countries, Baltic countries, I am quite sure that we will be able to save the common market. Otherwise, yes, the need for, to fight climate change, the need to be industrially independent for Europe, 
will trump our needs to have a free market economy in Europe. And finally, what I also have noticed for a couple of years, which gives us all hope, is that uh, even if leaders and presidents and prime ministers came together and said, we do not mind fossil fuel usage anymore, the big multinational companies, including the Swedish companies, have set sail. They've started spending down the road, spending to become climate neutral, to be clean in the nearest future because they've all realized the first ones who get there will win and the last ones will always pay. This makes me the most hopeful that the private sector actually has turned the corner. Therefore, for 2024, while we have many challenges, I do hope that seriously we will feel better off by the end of 2024. Not only in job politics, where I also hope nothing will massively go wrong, but also in fight against climate change. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Kalilaid, uh, for those uh, opening remarks that I think really set the scene. And with that, I'm going to pass over to our fantastic moderator who will introduce the panel. Over to you, Chloe, please. Thank you, uh, Rob, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be here today um, and with such a fantastic uh, eminent panel of speakers to, to look at the trends and um, these currents uh, that could shape 2024. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I um, just wanted to uh, remind everybody that there is a Q&A function um, and um, if, you can, if you have questions uh, along the discussions, just pop your questions in that Q&A box. Um, any interesting questions uh, might be actually passed on to me during the conversation, uh, so I might actually throw in some questions from the, um, uh, from the audience uh, during our discussion with the panel as well. Uh, and uh, uh, there will be some more time at the end to take uh, your questions. So them in there and we'll, um, we'll moderate them and, and get to them at the end of this discussion. Now, uh, let's get to our fantastic panel. Um, we're extremely lucky uh, to have these uh, four speakers with us today. Um, so first is uh, Cher Embo. Uh, he's a research professor and director general of the Centre de Suivi Écologique in Senegal. Uh, he, was, he has previously worked as director of uh, Future Africa at the University of Pretoria. Uh, the executive uh, director of Star International in Washington, D.C., and he has served as a lead uh, scientist on climate change at the World Agroforestry Center in Kenya. Uh, he is also a lead author on the agriculture, forestry, and other land use uh, chapters of the IPCC uh, AR5 and AR6 reports, and so his research spans food security, sustainable production in Africa, and natural resource management. Um, next, uh, we've got uh, Eileen O'Connor, and um, she is the Senior Vice President for Communications, Policy and Advocacy at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, she is a member of the executive team, um, which oversees government relations and strategic communications for all programs, uh, including on climate strategy. She's had an eminent career as a journalist and an attorney specializing in uh, complex litigations and, and crisis management in U.S. Russia and Ukraine, which is particularly relevant today. Um, she served as Vice President of Yale University and as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. Thank you for being with us today, Eileen. Um, we're very grateful. Uh, next, we've got uh, Pedro Formitag. Uh, he's the Deputy Director for Ex External Relations and G20 Expert at the Brazilian Center for International Relations, which is also known as SEBRI. Um, Brazil holds the rotating presidency of the G20 this year, and uh, the summit will be held uh, in July. Uh, so uh, we're, we're really grateful to have your expertise and insight, Pedro. I'm sure that will be relevant in our discussion. Um, and Pedro is trained as a lawyer and uh, has uh, taught um, courses on sustainable development and international law and international trade. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we're very lucky we've got also Inessa Umuhosa Grace um, with us today. She's a self-described eco-feminist. She's a climate activist and researcher from Rwanda. 
Uh, she is the co-founder and global coordinator of the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, which counts more than 900 youths across 70 plus countries. Um, and she's also the founder of the NGO Green Protector, uh, which aims to increase youth participation in climate action, climate education, and climate policy. Um, so thank you all very, very much um, for, for joining today. It's fantastic to have such a range of, uh, of expertise uh, with us. Um, and I would like um, to start with um, some reflections, perhaps, uh, from the, uh, uh, the former president of Estonia as a, a keynote speech. Um, she, she mentioned you know, quite poignantly that uh, Estonia is one of the least consciousness impacted by climate change, and yet it's seeing some of the uh, fastest uh, changing temperatures, creating unpredictability, both in terms of policy, but in also in terms of the need for resilience. Um, this comes on the back, I think, of, of the uh, UNEP emissions gap report. You know, the world is barreling towards 2.5 to 2.9 degrees of warming um, if we uh, implement the national determined contributions under the Paris Agreement fully. Um, and Antonio Guterres, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, has described this as an emissions canyon. Um, so this year, clearly, we need exponential uh, climate action in order to uh, get on track. Um, and I wanted to start with this, to, to set the scene, really, to ask you first, all of you, what are your reflections on these currents and what we've just heard, both um, from the presentation that Rob gave, but also from uh, the European perspective um, from Estonia? Uh, which of these issues do you think are you're the most concerned about um, and how can we start addressing these challenges this year are the particular um, things that you will be looking out for so maybe um, Eileen maybe we could start with you if you have a, a few kind of opening remarks as to where you think you know your your, your eyes are really set on this year thank you so much Chloe and thank you as well um, for having us, for having me and the Rockefeller Foundation able to uh, to participate in this very important conversation. Um, I would say that um, the, the, I think the president pointed out a lot of positives and negatives, but I would also argue that even with the positives, they can go one way or another. And so I think the currents, um, you know, and that's what the Rockefeller Foundation is really focused in on. We actually see and I'm going to say something kind of that's very counterintuitive. We see climate as an opportunity, but only if we actually address it in ways that completely transform systems. And if we do that in the right way, we can actually counter and reverse the inequality that, in our view, is actually driving this anti-democracy or this move away from democratic institutions and democratic governments. Because basically people are moving away from democracies, pluralism, multinationalism, because they feel that that hasn't worked for them as individuals. We've seen rising inequality around the world between countries and within countries, particularly in the United States. That is what is driving the politics here. So there has to be some democratic reforms. In this country, we have to do things like stop gerrymandering, get more money out of politics, things like that. But put that aside. I think the key here when you look at all three of these currents is, is how do you address these things without actually making them almost a negative? So the 1.5 degree, um, and we are, let's face it, we all know we're going to go beyond that because that's in the rear view win window. But it is driving, as the president pointed out, businesses and others, because they know that the risk that's coming at them is going to put all of their investments possibly literally underwater. And so we keep arguing with them that they have to do more to invest in energy transitions, particularly in the developing world. And that is where I would also argue this access to capital, the Bridgetown Initiative, which the Rockefeller Foundation is, is very, very involved with and has been, has been actually helping with fund the research behind that for years. We believe that that is really, really critical. As you know, yes, it's true that Europe and the global north have reduced, have transitioned to renewable energy, but the global south has not. And they are unable because the investment and the money is not there to do it. 
So I do think that this 1.5 is actually catalyzing potentially these movements with the IMF and the World Bank to fund more of that. Because we also believe, and this goes to my earlier point, if we can actually transform and renew and switch to renewables, the positive about renewables is that we can expand energy access beyond the grids that currently exist. There are 1.7 billion people without productive energy in the world. If we can give them productive energy, that can really boost their economic standards and their opportunity. So that's one area. In terms of a competition for space, I would also argue it's, it really is about land. But again, this is where some of these forces within existing systems, which is why we talk about transforming systems, are actually pushing back. Um, we need to transform the food system. 85% of the non-farmed arable land in the world is in Africa. So we're working on trying to actually energize local agriculture and using regenerative techniques in that agriculture, which actually can not only combat climate change, but can also enable many more people to actually have much more of an agrarian economy and be food secure. And so just like with energy transition, we can be energy secure. And so finally, too, I want to just talk about technology. Um, Actually, I, I, and, do you mind if I, if I, because that was a very good point, and I, 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 um, on farming and food and the food system, and I thought I might just, um, can you hear me okay? Because everybody seems to yeah. be pointing at me. Okay, brilliant. Um, I would like to ask uh, Shay, actually, if you could like yes, just, yes. Um, bounce back on, on what Eileen has said, and we'll come back to uh, technology uh, for sure, but um, what what do you think really stands out from these um, uh, from these quad, from these currents? And uh, you know, is, is there something around uh, food, particularly uh, that Eileen has mentioned, or uh, the opportunity of renewable energy and getting the capital right that you would like to uh, respond to? I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for, uh, to my predecessor for the in very insightful um, ideas. Um, there are several prongs in, in this issue of food security and climate change as regards to Africa. We all know that global warming will have a severe uh, toll on the food production in Africa in many ways. Uh, you can break it down in terms of drought, in terms of pests and diseases, in terms of adapted seeds, in germoplasm, um, many, 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 many water resource um, shortages in, in addressing food security in Africa. But on the segue, um, we also, as we come from Dubai, was pushing uh, to see where, you know, multilateralism can play a role uh, to fix these issues. Um, because we all know that climate change is radically and drastically related to air pollution in Europe and developed countries, which is having more than 95% of the whole greenhouse gas emission globally. And the, the less than 4% that Africa is putting in place is mostly driven by maybe two big economies, um, Egypt and South Africa, and the rest of the country is down to 2%. And if you see on the flip side, how much Africa is contributing to many of the solutions in climate change, particularly mitigation, the forests of Congo, the agroforest system and the savanna ecosystem, including mangroves uh, on the coastal areas, are really capturing, and our oceans are capturing a great deal of air pollution globally. So personally, I don't believe that Africa is a net emitter. It becomes a net sink when you put the whole budget into the table. So the fact of putting everybody in the same responsibility in climate change in relation to food security should be just reversed uh, and revised. And, and, and second, the issue of you know putting the polluters payers principle into the table to get the resources to help poor communities to adapt to climate change has been a lip service through the negotiation for many times. And we put loss and damage. I will let Inez talk about loss and damage, but I want to say is, uh, we are accredited, St. Lucivia Ecology is accredited the Green Climate Fund, uh, the Adaptation Fund recently. There is a, um, you know, a window uh, for adaptation in the African Development Bank in GCA. But getting $1 million from those processes will take you four years of negotiating the knowledge in the proposal and making sure you are at the standard of institutional requirement to mobilize those funding. So basically, they calibrate the accessibility to the resort of the resources, they calibrate it against 
the standards of international organization, which obviously local organization in Africa or communities who are suffering of climate change would not have easily. And we will depend of international consultant again and again, and the process will be long to take. But imagine that everything we are talking about require quick fix, uh, emergency, urgencies. And you have to wait for four or five years before you get your adaptation project or lesson damage project. I think there is something in the trends that need to be revised twice. The second point which I want to make is the issue of what we hear and what we feel. What we hear is the voluntary engagement of developed countries to reduce emission. What we feel is a big momentum towards fossil fuel. UK has released their licenses. Um, Germany, China, they're all going to, 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 to charcoal. Um, there is a new conflict in Latin America between uh, Nicaragua, et cetera, just because of fossil fuel. West Africa, coastal line, people are working on fossil fuel. There are two readings that I have on that. First of all, when we find fossil fuel, uh, everybody is interested, including those one who are thinking pollution is not good for the atmosphere. But and second thing, and coming from Dubai, I'm good in place to tell you, Many developing countries, they have been looking for the investment capital to unlock their development potential. And that investment capital never came from the World Bank or IMF. So what they rely on is natural resources, gold, fossil fuel, minerals, rare earths. And when they have those things, it's a unique opportunity for them to build the dollar sign that goes with the infrastructure that they need to move forward. Because the, the process of lending that money from the international market with unprecedented rate of return for those who are lending this money has been strangulating Africa for many years. So we have to look this just transition um, issues, how to invest on untapped resources in Africa, because we have so many potential under climate change to, uh, to gain food security by improving and optimizing water resource use, using, using the right seed at the right place and making sure that the forgotten habits and, 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 and plants are used. And just to finish on that issues of forgotten products, um, Africa is more than the five crop weeds um, that are reported globally for food security by FAO. We have more over hundred species, highly nutritious, fruits, grains, um, you know, uh, nutrition rich, plants that needs to be promoted. And they are resistant to, to the context of climate change because they're adapted to drought in many ways. But those things need to find ways to go through the agricultural or agronomic policy in Africa. So it's a package of solutions. I'm optimistic more than pessimistic because the potential is there. We just need to unshackle it. Over sure. to you. Sure. sure. Um... That, thank you, thank you for those remarks. I, I would like to, to 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 bounce off that and go to Pedro. Um, I think we've heard quite uh, clearly uh, the the opportunity that can be there, whether that's um, uh, you know with with renewable energy resources, but also on land and, and farming and the biodiversity that's a, the that's then the carbon sink um, of Africa, for example, that uh, Chef was just mentioning. The, the G20 this year is going to be key to address some of these issues around fossil fuels around finance. Um, so how do you see, you know, what are the most important of these currents for you? How do you see them fitting in uh, the Brazilian presidency of the of the G20? And what are you specifically looking out for this year um, that could shift the needle maybe on finance or on delivering uh, that fossil fuel uh, transition which uh, the world is committed to at uh, COP28 in Dubai? Thank you for such an interesting question. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is that when I was reading the currents that you guys put together, um, the, the, the discussion that you guys framed in terms of land use, um, uh, actually the discussion about the one and a half uh, centigrade threshold, you know, this year of 2023, and I think it's gonna be the same in 2024, from a Brazilian perspective, maybe in the future, we're going to call it, you know, the year when climate changed for real. You know, um, so many extreme weather events took place within a very short time frame. I'm not going to, you know, name everything that happened, but we within the Brazilian territory, for instance, we had, you know, 
uh, severe droughts in the Amazon, including the Amazon River. But at the same time, in the southernmost part of our territory, very severe floods in two of our largest cities, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, uh, where I'm speaking from. Uh, historical uh, extreme heat events. Uh, we had people dying for the first time, to be honest, uh, because of a, uh, an episode of extreme heat in the city of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and I can, can, can think of other examples in, in, in here, in our neighbor, uh, Argentina also suffered a lot, especially in terms of their agricultural uh, output, uh, because of uh, another uh, crisis of drought. So, um, unfortunately, I think that's going to be a, a, a trend and a current within the next few years. I mean, uh, like I, I, Eileen said, uh, you know, she had the courage to mention. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not comfortable admitting that, but let's just all face it. Uh, one and a half uh, degrees is, is, is just behind us, right? Um, and I think that's going to be one of the setting topics, uh, agenda setting topics for the G20. Um, you know, is it important for the world to discuss uh, the decarbonization of our energy mix? Yes, absolutely. But let's let's just please keep in mind that certain countries have different challenges and opportunities. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the example of Brazil and this is um, a particular frame that we're gonna uh, go about in our uh, effort to go about the G20. So um, the case of Brazil when it comes to our energy mix is a very particular one because if you look at, uh, if you look up at the mix, you'll notice that a great part of, our, of the energy we consume and produce is already renewable. So if you look at the cars and the whole transportation system in Brazil, so much of it is actually dependent on uh, biofuel, right? Uh, ethanol in particular. And when it comes to le electricity, so much of it proportionally is also dependent on hydroelectric dams. That doesn't mean that we still, we don't have any homework to do on that front, but uh, it is fair to say that if it, if it was just a matter of, you know, uh, energy, um, Brazil would already be the greenest of G20 countries. That's This is something that I've always uh, make an effort to remind people about. Uh, and, and that speaks... Sure. So I was going to say, so looking forward to the G20 and to 2024, are there things that you think that position around Brazil's energy mix, for example, what does that mean in terms of what it can... Uh, how we can drive the conversation forward, particularly on on that fossil fuel, um, you know, transition discussion. Uh, are, are there things that means like what does the Brazilian uh, G20 presidency has of specific that it can bring this year when we think about uh, you know uh, both transition of fossil fuels and the just uh, energy transition, which means financing, which as we've heard, um, isn't available uh, at the scale and speed needed for developing countries. Yeah, so if you look at the priorities that the Brazilian government has set for the G20, uh, there are three of them. Uh, and one is, like you mentioned, pretty much in those terms, uh, just energy transition. Um, we it, Countries like Brazil, and I think that's the case of other emerging countries in South America, for instance, uh, there's, Eileen mentioned, I couldn't agree more, that you know the cl climate change is also an opportunity. And for countries like Brazil and other countries in South America, that's one particularly interesting way of framing the issue, especially uh, in the context of the G20, which is after all a discussion about the global economy. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you look at some of the you know, most underprivileged uh, regions in Brazil, that's precisely where a great deal of international investment is being made towards uh, solar energy plants. You know, uh, in the short and medium term, this is also going to be the case for uh, on and offshore wind uh, energy. So in Brazil, and you know, I think that's the case of other uh, African, South Asian countries, uh, South American countries, of course. If these countries are able to take the opportunity and also the challenge of climate change and the energy transition to you know, uh, modernize their industrial agenda and in the process create jobs and, and help foster development in certain regions of their countries that still need help, 
uh, that's that's the way we should go about it. I'm just I'm just pointing out the particular aspect of, of the energy role in the Brazilian decarbonization agenda because um, when it comes to my country, our problem is much more related to land use, right? Um, yeah. We have a very serious problem with these deforestation, and you guys mentioned it in one of the uh, one of the currents, the, the the one about the spatial. I found it an amazing title, by the way, the space race. Um, the issue of land use uh, and the way the Brazilian Congress has recently, uh, you know, made the wrong decision, in my opinion, to uh, deconstruct some of the protections against indigenous people's uh, lands. Uh, so that's particularly problematic. But I would say that, you know, given that this is the number one priority when it comes to our decarbonization agenda, uh, the new government has indeed been able to dramatically decrease the level of uh, illegal deforestation. There's still homework to be done, but um, we are, we are, we're going on the right path. Great. Let's um, let's come back to land in a second because um, and, and try and keep the answers a bit shorter. Otherwise, we'll, we'll struggle to get through all the themes. But Inessa, I'd like to come to you. I think there's been um, you know both Eileen and Pedro have uh, uh, raised this around. You know, basically, we're likely to have passed. With 1.5 is probably gone. You know, that's we, we're likely to to, to overshoot the 1.5 degree goal target. That has, as uh, Pedro has said, has been quite sensitive. Um, think to say what do you make of that do you think um, we should start having a conversation about um, uh, overshooting 1.5 and how do we reduce the risks associated with that um, how do you see that also linking to your work on loss and damage how do we take that conversation forward in your opinion in 2020 uh, hi um, can you hear me I think I was having a bit of a, an we internet. Can hear you. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, nice. Um, thank you. For... Um, you... Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you seem to to freeze a bit. Perhaps if you turn off the video yes. for a minute, um, it might be easier. Oops. Inessa. Okay, I, I think we have lost uh, Inessa. Um, okay, maybe, Sheikh, uh, maybe you can take on that, that question. I think, uh, you know, Eileen made that um, strong remark, uh, which Pedro said you agreed with, uh, but um, uh, realized that um, uh, there was a sensitive issue uh, around this. But, uh, you know, should the world start a conversation about the risks associated uh, with overshooting the 1.5 degree goal and how we manage those risks. Um, you know, should 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 we go there? But yeah, um, she, she, like in, in Issa, but yeah, Inessa, please. Sorry, Inessa first, and then Sheikh, maybe you can answer. Yes. Go for it, Inessa. Yes. Uh, thank. Uh, thanks for Apple uh, for the internet. Uh, but uh, I'll just try to be quick. Uh, so for me, I think uh, it's two way to see. Uh, so again. I am I'm one of the people who are really, really op optimistic in my whole life. So whenever we're talking about overshooting, sorry in the language, I'm like, why? But we can still save the 1.5 uh, because we all know what it really takes to really uh, keep the 1.5 alive. Although we are not comfortable to really um, understand fully on how we have to go there in a short time because it's going to require all of us to change our way of thinking and our way of doing our business as usual. So when um, you were sharing about uh, the three currents that you are having, I was I was like, if you add on one on finance, like a proper finance, access to bit of finance, then that will make the full cycle, uh, especially for the generation of mine. And when you look on African context, um, everything is relying on how each continent is going to be able to be a deal maker. And when you look on how this process is going to look like, Africa is able to change the pace of the whole world. The world from uh, Eileen, if we see climate change as an opportunity, but for that it has to be fully integrated in all the plans of uh, um, economic development or also, all, uh, all the justice that we're talking about. Because currently the reason why we are all frustrated 
the reason why we are tend to be a little bit pessimistic is because we have what did go wrong in the past. And I feel like we are also able to change our um, and that's why, for example, we need to acknowledge the role that Africa Okay, um, Inessa, we seem to... Has to play, or like to, uh, to which you're able... Sorry. Sorry. Again, you're, lost. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think uh, uh, I, I think we understand that point very clearly, really important, that you, we, we need to be able to integrate climate action, climate protection, nature protection into everything we do, into core um, uh, economic and political strategies. Um, Sheikh, I would just like to come back to you on that 1.5 point. What do you think about this discussion over overshoot? Um, is this a conversation that we need to start having? Um, uh, and, 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 and if so, do we, what, what kind of, what do we do with geoengineering? What do we do with governance? What do we do with other forms of technology, maybe like CDR? How do you think that conversation uh, will evol evolve this year? And, and what are the important messages for you um, to get across? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think Ineza was making good point that um, the the possibility to 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 have big wins on the one point five those opportunities still exist, and I agree with that rhetoric of being positive because if you see something as just a problem, you will never find a solution, and we have been as humankind um, pushing for the very hard solutions in the past to combat ozone layer, to, to, to make sure that overfishing is reduced. And now plastic is on the pitch and air pollution in big cities. If China managed to, to, to deport um, some of the big cities, that's, some, that's a potential of leapfrogging and accelerating transformation in that very sense. But uh, there is the optimism on one side and the realism in the other side. My realism brings me to check the global stock take report uh, which is uh, the midway um, report from Paris Agreement to 2030. So what we see is that the the ambition of reducing uh, greenhouse gas by 43% uh, to achieve 1.5%, that ambition has not been put towards even 10%. So we have a huge gap in mitigation, which is not yet ready in any NDC, or any political or climate policy across the globe. And we all know that the six years remaining to 2030 would be an illusion for the humanity to go from this 10% to 43% of emission reduction. So, but the fact of being on track and moving towards 1.5 degree would probably lead us to somewhere which is much better from where we are right now. And my optimism is to be to that point, even if it's a short, uh, if it's a midway towards our ambition, it would be important not to completely, uh, you know, discourage ourselves and keep going on that very pace. And and in there, in there, in in that space, what I think is there are many things that we need to combat. One thing is the power relationship when it comes to, to, to combating air pollutions and, and, and greenhouse gas emissions. What I mean by that is when we negotiate as government on climate change, the private sector, who is the main polluter, are not asked to play any big role in, in this multilateralism process. Now it's catching up. The private fund is put in place in Dubai. The mayors of cities are now being organized. And these non-heard voices, even concluding, including the community who are planting trees in a daily basis, that unheard voices who are not participating in the negotiation, but who implement um, the climate policy in the daily basis, needs to have better place into the discussion that we are having right now. So what I'm urging SIE to do in terms of advocacy is to take those uh, game changers, those agents for change, which are not the traditional state and government negotiators to be playing a big role into accelerating um, um, this process. And the potential of having tapping into those um, co communities are absolutely uh, critical and very high. And last but not least, when you look at the structure of NDCs, 
Most indices, particularly in Africa, are based on natural resource processes, agroforestry, soil management, etc. And the problem we have in unlocking that potential is the conditional requirement in most of those INDC. Maybe 80% of the indices in Africa are conditional. They need technical capacity, they need financial resources, they need technical support from the north, but those su support system that needs to be put in place have never been there. So I'm talking for the Africa context where the indices will only be successful when the prerequisite, which are the conditional requirement, are put in place, which is not yet the case. And last but not least, how do we characterize, and UNISA can come that, loss and damage? What is the semantical meaning of something which is called loss and damage? What's the cultural dimension of it? How do we assess the magnitude of loss and damage and put a dollar sign on it in order to mobilize the funding, which is now the new window open at the World Bank? So there are many issues that we need to accelerate in terms of the international governance structure if we want to achieve 1.5. But to be honest with you, I am losing um, totally hope um, of achieving it by 2030. But let's keep going. Let's keep our pace. We will lead. So we will go somewhere which is quite interesting to be and, and to reduce climate change impact. Over to you. Thank you for those uh, reflections. And uh, uh, Eileen, back to you uh, on this 1.5. Question: You know, you you expressed quite clearly at the beginning reports that uh, you know 1.5 was was gone without the overshoot. Um, what do we do with that? Do you think that that has the potential to um, spur some more action? Uh, do you think there's, a, there's that risk of the doom loop, which was outlined in the currents? Um, and 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 how do we see technology being part of that? Uh, I think one of the questions from uh, the uh, audience. Um, was asking about, you know, how do we implement correctly, appropriately, efficiently uh, carbon dioxide removal, for example? Um, what are your, what is your sense? Well, there's some, yeah, okay. So first of all, on the 1.5, I, I think I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, um, as I say in the United States. I'm not trying to, to be so negative that we lose sight of, of what's possible. Uh, but I am trying to say that actually, I do think it can spur. Um, uh, spur action, and I think it's spurring action in the business community. Ashega, you are absolutely right. It is private investment that must, must come to the table. And so that is why we have been working on carbon market initiatives, both with Secretary Kerry and the Energy Transition Accelerator, so that countries can actually give carbon credits for energy transition projects. Because the amount of money that we're putting in, and we're working in over a dozen countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. And, and the problem that we have to, to go into 2030 is, and, and you're also absolutely right, climate, the, and how we address climate change has to be linked to development. Mm -hmm. The investment in climate change must be an investment in development. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that all of these models about emissions don't take into account the need for additional energy for countries to develop. And so the emissions out of that need, and, and obviously if they don't have alternatives, they're gonna go to coal or they're sure. gonna go to diesel. I mean, and so that is exactly what we understand and accept. And so that's also one of the one of the other points you've made, Sheikh, is that we've also been investing in things like the School of Africa regulation, which we're trying to actually build up capacity on what regulations, what are the, the conditions that are needed for say transitions to a just transition, by the way, like okay. worker training, et cetera, energy transitions, and even food system transitions. Like you've talked about, there's so much opportunity in Africa on agriculture. And, um, and so anyway, in terms of your question on technology, so we get a lot from a lot of big players in this space, um, and I won't name them, but they're technologists. And they say, just wait, you know what you guys are all talking about, you know, development and and um, that's that shouldn't be your focus. Your focus should be technology, technology, technology and technology will fix this. But we don't believe that technology alone, unless it's pointed in the right direction, unless it is actually accessible and affordable to developing countries. We've seen this with vaccines. If the IP laws and, you know, if, if we don't enable African universities and African research centers 
and Asian research centers to develop this technology and own this technology, then we're not going to get to where we need to be, both with climate and with development. That's one of the reasons that we've been investing in a battery electric storage system initiative where, to your point about storage, it's so critical. But the problem is for purchasers of any kind of technology um, in Africa, the amount and the qu quantity is so low, the prices are very high. They also have that access to capital issue. So we've built a consortium to try to drive down those costs and figure out how can we basically do pooled procurement and and possibly even for, for the Rockefeller Foundation, how can we invest in looking for less expensive technologies that would work? We're also looking at how do we really maximize grid technology and the efficiency of grids, because that too will actually improve the storage systems. So we've been working with Google X, for example, to kind of bring some of that technology into Africa. So technology is great, but I do think some technology is better than other. The carbon capture system that everyone, that oil and gas really hypes up and they hyped it up a lot at COP, obviously. That technology requires a ton of, um, of, um, that, of water and other natural resources. And it's very expensive and it's not that effective. So instead of talking about how do we keep ourselves connected to oil and gas, why are we not investing and talking more about the alternative fuels? And the reason is because the system needs transformation and not just tinkering around the edges. And that's what we really feel. I mean, and in terms of nuclear, we see nuclear as part of the mix. I mean, we don't actually see that, you know, let's go for as safe as possible, clean as possible nuclear. So I think that's really um, the, um, the um, you know, that's where we think about technology. Hope I didn't go on too long. No, thank you, thank you, um, Eileen, for that. And this, uh, let's go back to you. Hopefully, your internet is a bit uh, more stable. Um, on those points, I mean, we've heard around the opportunity that there is uh, in developing countries in Africa around uh, around land. I mean, there's the issue of trade off, but there's also this opportunity. Um, and oops, Anissa, are you still here? Yes. If you can still hear me, Anissa, I was going to ask you um, another. A question that's just popped up, uh, popped up from one of our uh, listeners. Um, how do you think, based on Eileen has just said, um, how do you think um, African industrializations can avoid locking in um, greenhouse gas emissions? What do you see as um, uh, way forwards or discussions that the continent needs to have this year, maybe on the back of the um, uh, African Climate Summit uh, that took place uh, in September, which very much um, presented uh, the responding to climate crisis also as an opportunity. How do you see that maybe that discussion um, evolving this year? Um, I think I think for me, the answer would go back to um, in, uh, local innovation and local centers in this sector. Because for a long time we've been um, there's this kind of understanding that there's that there's no innovation in Africa, there's no expert in Africa. But I think uh, going back to what Elin uh, Elin said, sorry if I'm kidding your name, uh, just to um, empower the local university, local researchers to be able to design the solution in our own context. Because for a long time we've been adopting solution and program out of uh, criteria and triggering points that are not really reflecting our national circumstance. So if we are able to enable our researchers and um, be able to boost the, uh, the, uh, the uh, innovation um, uh, drive, especially for the young people currently, because now young people are more interested in innovation, um, if also able to really talk the languages that our policy um, are which is again like access to the uh, renewable access energy or the fund, which um, which really translates in really understanding that when Africa is calling for uh, maybe um, a an access of funds within the World Bank uh, on the grant base on the or a high concession loan, it's not like we are begging. It's just just technically we we've been accessing this fund, paying the debts, but now we're aware of 
out of not really doing the thing for uh, for our community and for our continent and now changing the cluster for us actually demanding something in the proper format in a proper modality that is able to address our current problem but also able to tackle the international pro uh, problem is one is one of the way uh, to see it and coming to the question that i think um shake uh, mentioned about how do we Damage, for example, how do can how can you put a cost? Uh, for me, I think I can use a simple example. Uh, in May in last year, in just only three nights, uh, with the intensive rainfall, our country lost one percent of GDP in just three nights. And when you look on the amount of uh, uh thing that would uh, that would destroy it, yes, we have people who died, uh, but we have roads and infrastructure. But you cannot people's life or livestock, those are labeled as non-economic um, impact, uh, uh, impact of loss and damage. But when we are talking about infrastructures, roads, those are economic, that's some of the example of the economic um, impact of loss and damage. And then when you look on how our country is going to be able to rebuild back after those, uh, uh, those events, we do not have any fund or anything that is that we are losing, for example, a road that was uh, built um, out of a loan from the World Bank, but then we are not responsible of this being destroyed so because of climate change, then we need something that is much more um, um, justified in a way, in a justice way for us to get access of the fund to be able to, um, to rebuild back faster for the community because we are losing our development. So that is, um, that is, uh, that is how things are. And the the really thing that really kind of make me sad is that you go in the room and people are uh, asking you, uh, can you prove to us that you're actually dying? Um, the like, uh, this loss and damage real is climate uh, crisis happening, and uh, where uh, where the solution? And yet you are coming from, uh, you know, the reality and the uh, people tend not to listen and the thing then going back to empowering our local uh, research institution and people and uh, um and leaders to be able to speak from facts because i think for for a certain point of time we get went to um really having this assumption that when people are talking about climate justice climate uh, climate advocacy reaching uh, 1.5 alive keeping 1.5 alive or um, uh, restoration of the nature people tend to think that we are speaking from an emotional basis but yes it's emotional because it's kind of a day right reality but it's also being backed up with the science with these facts there's a uh, the experience of the people the community so maybe um maybe closing that cycle uh, in a way that at least people are able to understand that uh, yes climate uh, climate is an opportunity but only if we are hopeful and opening our eyes strong enough to really see it because otherwise we are losing the we are losing the opportunity window and the current generation I kind of think is the one that is holding that uh, kind of a, a scotch between those two uh, like going chaotic or going hopefully and uh, it's very also a very unfortunate to see that in some rooms, uh, there's no really participation of young people, there's no youth, there's no women, there's no children, and yet we are the one promising them to have a future, a better future, but they're not somewhere to be found in terms of expressing their concern and their solution as well, because they're also driving solution at home. Yeah, I think that's a strong message uh, for any policymakers or anybody who's going to be holding events and summits this year that... Uh... You know the young people need to be uh, in in those rooms. They are the ones that are going to be uh, impacted the most uh, by the warming of the planet. Um, Pedro, I'd like to go come back to you because you, you we you just started to discuss land, um, and I I know there's a, this is a vast topic, and we only have a few minutes per per issue really. But um, uh, can you speak a little bit about that? I think um, we we heard from the former Estonian. Uh, president of this risk of trade-off between climate protection and nature protection, uh, you know, this competition for land and um, access and, and resources is really, really uh, cranking up uh, this year and has been. Um, how, do you see, how do we address this trade-off? How do you see this conversation evolving and what, what could be um, solutions to maybe address that um, in the years to, you know, th this year? Maybe if you can be Fairly brief, that would be brilliant. Yeah, um, I think, you know, uh, I like the way you guys framed the current because um, you managed to speak about different contexts in which land has become an issue. I mean, in, in the particular case of a country like Brazil, 
like I said, um, the, the, the trouble that we have in our decarbonization strategy is so much more related to illegal deforestation in all of our biomes, but in particular, the Amazon. And at the heart of this problem is, you know, the, you know, lack of resources or the defunding of uh, environmental law enforcement policy and a problem that was, you know, created in the particular administration of the Brazilian government. Uh, and now the government is new, the administration is new. And just by, you know, uh, leveling up a little bit of, you know, the bare minimum to, to uh, enforce environmental law, deforestation has been able to be, uh, start to be addressed. I also enjoyed the way uh, the, 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 the real estate and the attention that you guys paid to the issue of the blue economy and how we're gonna think about the sustainable resource management of the oceans. You know, I don't think that's something that we get, we pay enough attention to if you look at the international policy conversation. And so I wanna uh, compliment you guys on that. Um, when it comes to our, the, the contribution that Brazil and in particular SEBRI can deliver on that, we're going to pay a lot of attention to that in the way we frame the G20 debates. So uh, one of the task forces of T20, which is the engagement group, group of think tanks, uh, task force number two will be particularly devoted to that. Um, uh, and the, 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 in particular, the problem of deforestation, but also uh, at SEBRI, we're starting a new project for, that focuses uh, on the you know different options that a country like Brazil has when it comes to harnessing the potential for its uh, for the oceans and for its uh, sea territory, uh, so th th that will be my you know my general uh, my general point. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you uh, for keeping that short as well. I mean, there's um, we, we've spoken about lots of different things and all of these uh, topics and currents are completely intertwined. But I would like to uh, ask all of you um, about how do you see multilateralism and, you know, multilateral institutions um, are clearly facing a test this year. I mean, they have been. We've got this super year of election um, and a major test for democracy across the world, you know, how how is the reform of the international um, order and the multilateral system really going to help us deliver, you know, accelerated climate action, stepped up nature protection, um, and the sustainable development that uh, you know that, that the world needs and so many people um, uh, very very desperately need? Where do you see that um, you know reform to the crux of the system, uh, and maybe what are you looking out for specifically? Uh, on that this year, um, Sheikh, do you want to do you want to start? Maybe uh, just be try and be fairly brief, and we'll go round. Yeah. Very briefly and, and 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 quick. Thank you for the question. But first of all, I think uh, the homework that those multilateral organizations are asking us to do, which is integrated approach, combined you know thinking as we are doing now in a transdisciplinary approach, they are not doing that at the level. The World Trade Organization is not talking to the UNFCCC, and the Convention of Biodiversity is not talking to the Desertification Convention. And I think there will be there will, there is a need of a place where those multilateral big building blocks needs to meet to create cohesion again, you know, between themselves when it comes to achieving sustainability in many places. The second thing I think we are they are not looking at enough. Is the bottom-up approach that Inesa was mentioning. Um, after you finish an APCC report, how do you, you know, break it down to the reality of Njala, of Senegal, of Kafrin in different localities with the right language, which speaks to the reality of the context, with addressing the right problems and creating this bottom-up approach, this ascendant approach that helps resolve problems at, at, as, 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 as a local level. That's one dimension. Second dimension, which is the last point which I want to make, is related to Africa. How do we create jobs for the increasing demography and the youth coming in? The potential is there. And by the way, talking about the potential, my colleague from Rockefeller, uh, Elin, mentioned that 60% of the arable land is in Africa. I would challenge you, Elin, to show me where those lands are. Because this Montpellier, this Montpellier report is telling it, but at the same time, leaving the reality in Africa, I'm looking for those arable land which are not untapped in Africa. 
So we need some kind of rebuilding the linkage between the, the global rhetoric and the local reality. And this bottom-up approach is something required. Thank you, over to you. Super, and a challenge there for anybody uh, who can uh, show Sheikh where that 60% uh, <laughs> comes from. Uh, Aileen, uh, back to you. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that reforming the multilateral system? Where the nod, what are the nods that you're particularly looking for um, this year? Well, I think Sheikh said, just basically said it really well. The multinational system is way too siloed. And one of the things we've been working on in food security is linking the, the multinational system that's in, in humanitarian assistance on food security with those institutions that are, that are focused on agricultural development. We spend a lot of time on, on, on the crisis management that's not linked and that's not money that goes into actually fixing the problem. And so we believe those things have to come together. We've been working on the SDGs, you know, for a while, the 17 rooms uh, conversation. But again, it, we really need to, as Sheikh said, get more granular for each country. And he's absolutely right. A lot of these statistics, a lot of these things don't really, they're sort of generalized and they don't necessarily spell out exactly, you know, point by point which are the problems. So that sounds like I'm just reversing what I said, but I'm, uh, you know, basically we have to put de develop money for development and money for crisis together in the multinational system and, and kind of stop trying to just plug holes and start trying to fix the problems. Um, I also do think that we have to really bring business into the conversation. I mean, in our view, unfortunately, business is actually overtaken in many systems, you know, the, the, they sort of are the more driving force versus government in many things for good and for bad. So how can we harness the power of business and private investment for good? Sure. And, so, sorry, because we're really uh, running out of time and I want to, to, to leave uh, Inessa briefly, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, crisis money, development money, Aileen, um, Aileen said, had needs to be together uh, in, in sort of a two set sentences. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, uh, thanks. I will try to be as brief as possible, adding to what Sheikh and Elaine said, and uh, I think for me to be a redefined global solidarity, because currently all the process that we're trying to fix, uh, not fixing the whole, like uh, uh, like fixing the problem, is to also go back to know what's at the foundation we are standing on, because now we are pretty sure that it's the foundation we're standing on, we're not as inclusive as possible, and we're not as engaging as possible, so that, that's why we need to redefine global solidarity so that we can all take concrete uh, action. So that would be as brief as that can be. Thank you. Brilliant. Pedro, that seems like uh, you know, a line for the G20, redefining global solidarity. Um, what do you make of that uh, in this year going forward? Yes, that's one of the three topics that the government has elected as a priority, and we're focusing on that. Even though we're not government affiliated, of course, we're also focusing on that. Uh, you know, just the fact that uh, the member states that are currently at the UN, 80% of them were colonies back when the institution was founded. That piece of information alone should be enough for us to pretty much, you know, end the discussion whether or not we should reform multilateralism. But uh, if we want to talk about solutions, I, I would suggest two particular pathways. One, in terms of geography. So there needs to be more um, power, more vote, more uh, voice given to Southeast Asia, Asia at large, uh, not to mention Africa. I think that goes without saying. I would also, uh, this is something we're gonna focus on. Uh, I would also mention that, uh, 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 an improvement in terms of topics. Um, and you guys wrote all, also about that in, 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 in the document you guys wrote. I mean, uh, no one could think of AI regulation and whether or not that was a international topic back in San Francisco in 1945, right? Um, uh, you know, all, all the topics associated to, 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 to technology. Um, and I'm afraid, you know, I, I'm sorry, Pedro, we're actually um, sort of really yeah, running yeah, out of time. So much to discuss and so little time. We do want to uh, leave the, the final word to Mans um, uh, of SEI. Uh, thank you so much, uh, panelists, for your contribution. And um, I'm sure the conversation is just getting started. Over to you, Mans. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you all panelists, uh, Sheikh, Inessa, Eileen, Pedro, been great to listen to you. Thank you, Chloe, for your moderation and Rob for the currents. Like multilateralism is fragmented and under pressure. 
the harsh reality of 1.5 degree overshoot conflict and competition over space and land. These are actually changing and are, are shaping our priorities at SEI up to 2030. For example, I'll give you a, a very short taste of this. We will be focusing less on goal setting, agenda setting, intentions and aspirations, and more on actions on the ground and implementation, supporting action, researching how to do implementation and researching for supporting implementation. When it comes to land, <laughs> research programs will be launched related to materials, mining, land, food systems change, how to promote new value chains that are more inclusive and sustainable and supply the materials that we need for the transition and get the transition right. And on the multilateralism, I think we, we are still believing in evidence and enlightenment and engagement of science in diplomacy, and we will increase our efforts to promote science-based diplomacy. Uh, a little bit old school, but we still think it can work if it's done right. And also work across, of course, other, other partners uh, and change agents in civil society and businesses that, that will be part of, of driving transitions moving forward. So with that, uh, fantastic uh, to hear you all. Thank you all so much for listening, all participants, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Have a good day. Bye.